Um, I hope very much that it's already feeling to you like a worthwhile day. Um, I think we were served a rich plate of biblical exposition uh, this morning with a very welcome side dish of laughter thrown in complimentary. Um, I, I meant what I said at the start of the Eucharist, that that, that was the heart of the day. Um, so at the risk of pushing a metaphor too far, um, if the Eucharist was the main course, um, then Bishop Gordon served up for us a perfect appetizer. Uh, the bad news is that we're now skipping the dessert and going straight to the cheese course. Um, that's to say, if this morning was a close engagement with a biblical text laced with wit and wisdom, then this afternoon is a close engagement with a biblical text. Uh, that's to say, there will still be nourishment in the next hour, I hope, but it's likely to be more of an acquired taste. So think pongy cheese, dry cracker, and if you're very lucky, a limp stick of celery. Um, Bishop Gordon was opening up for us through John 21, a reminder of those characteristic hallmarks of Christian discipleship, being loved and bearing witness. The first part is passive. We are loved, beloved. Before we say or do anything, before we make any attempt to deserve that status, we are loved. We are beloved in spite of our manifold flaws and fallibilities, in spite of our sins and our shortcomings. That is the most fundamental truth about each one of us, and it is a truth that can never be overwritten. We are loved. If you didn't have a good grasp of that before this morning, I trust that Gordon's exposition of John 21 has encouraged you to grasp it. The second part, however, is active. We have a calling, a vocation to serve the God of love in the world. And it is a shared vocation, a shared commission, not unique to any individual follower of Jesus, but shared in common by every follower of Jesus. Together, we have this task, this mission, to bear witness to what we have seen and heard of God. The Christian life, the outworking of our baptism is simply this, to live as those who know that they are loved and who know that they are called to bear witness. To live as those who know that we are loved and seek to dwell, to abide in that love, and to live as those who know that they are sent and so seek to be fruitful in bearing witness to the God who has loved us and called us. And what Bishop Gordon has shown us is true of John 21, I want to suggest is also true of the prophecies of Isaiah. Specifically, true of Isaiah chapters 40 to 55, sometimes distinguished from what comes before them and what comes after them as the prophecies of Deutero-Isaiah, which are also the chapters in which we encounter this mysterious figure, the servant of the Lord. For the next half hour or so, I'm going to try and do two things. First, I want to home in on Isaiah 43, verses 1 to 7, which is printed for you on the handout. 
I want to begin there firstly because that text will allow me to illustrate what you will hear me say again and again and again that although of course Holy Scripture is always more than carefully crafted literature it is seldom less than that Isaiah 43 is what is technically called a chiasm uh, from the Greek letter chi, which is like an, an X shape, which is itself symmetrical. So the first seven verses of Isaiah 43 are a beautiful poem with a symmetrical shape. And at the heart of that poem is the affirmation that Israel is loved by God. So the second reason for wanting to start there in Isaiah 43, 1-7 is that it offers the most explicit prequel, uh, if you like, in the prophecies of Deutero-Isaiah to the truth that uh, Bishop Gordon was spelling out for us, um, that like every Christian, Israel is loved. I'll then widen the lens a little to look at other passages in Isaiah 40-55 to which make it clear that Israel is loved. Um, for one thing, Isaiah 43 verse 4 is not the only verses, uh, verse in these chapters in which the Lord's love for Israel is made clear. But slightly beyond that, there are a group of associated terms in these chapters which I think function to reinforce that basic point. Um, Israel is chosen, formed from the womb, the object of God's compassion, um, and so on. I'll then want to show thirdly, beginning in Isaiah 43 again, but then widening the lens once more, that like every Christian, according to John 21, Israel is called to bear witness to God as a herald, um, a light to the nations. But then, for actually the greater part of the um, lecture, I want to try to trace the line of connection that joins what Isaiah says to what John says, because the connection is not quite direct, I think. Um, if I'm right, the connection moves from what Isaiah says about Israel to what Isaiah says about the prophet and the servant of the Lord to Jesus and to what John says um, about those who are followers of uh, Jesus. In my view, the line of collection is all the more secure by not being direct, all the more secure because it goes via the prophet stroke servant of the Lord and Jesus um, from Israel to Christians. You can decide whether um, that matters or not. So for much of the next um, half hour or so, I'm going to be focusing on the relationship between the servant of the Lord who appears in the four so-called servant songs in Isaiah 40 to 55, uh, the relationship of that servant figure with Israel, which in the context of Isaiah 40 to 55 more generally, is also frequently called the servant of the Lord. So what's the connection between Israel as servant of the Lord and this mysterious figure in the servant songs who is called the servant um, of, the, of the Lord? So let me begin by um, homing in on Isaiah 43 verses uh, 1 to 7 uh, to begin with. Um, you can almost immediately see, I hope, from the way in which I've laid out the verses um, on the handout, how beautifully crafted this text is. The the form of the poetry serves its function. It serves to direct our attention to that um, central um, affirmation that Israel is loved by God. The, the central point is heavily underlined by the elegant way in which the poem is organized. So the point is made in verse 4, but accentuated by the three verses um, either side. So in verse 1 you'll see the words created and formed. Um, at least you'll see them if you're looking at the handout, which um, uh, uses the translation uh, from the New Revised Standard Version, which I'll be referring to throughout the lecture. Um, if you're um, consulting your own translation, you'll see those exact same terms in English, created and formed in the um, NIV, the ESV, um, even the um, Roman Catholic New Jerusalem Version, 
uh, if you're consulting some other version and those two terms are not there, um, then I want to suggest um, that's a problem with your uh, translation, but that's probably a lecture uh, for another day. If you let your eyes drop then to verse 7, you'll see the same two words, created and formed. So twice in this brief poem, right at the beginning and right at the end, Israel is reminded that God is his creator. It is the people of God, not any individual Israelite, who is, um, which is in view here. It is Jacob, Israel, uh, who is created and formed by God. But the Lord through the prophet goes on to affirm more than that. Uh, the Lord through the prophet goes on to say, I have called you by name. Uh, that's also verse 1. And you'll know that in the Bible, naming is a serious business. It means uh, that God has not just made his people, but has bound himself to them or them to himself. He knows them and in calling them by name has summoned them into relationship with himself. But note again, it is the whole people of God rather than any single Israelite, which is in view. It is Israel, Jacob, whom the Lord has called by name. So now look down again towards the end of the poem, to the beginning of verse 7. This time the words from the top are not repeated exactly, uh, almost word for word, but not quite. It doesn't say, I've called you by name. It says, I have called you by my name. Um, that is subtly different. It is a wonderful thing for Israel to know that the Lord, the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, has called his people by name. But how much more wonderful that he has called his people by his own name. This is an act of adoption, isn't it? Or, or perhaps an act of marriage on the assumption that when two become one flesh, the result is a shared surname. It's an act of extraordinary unification. Israel will now be called by the Lord's name. But the parallel with verse 1 is still clear. So two things more. In verse 2, you'll see that the Lord assures Israel, I will be with you. In fact, uh, the Lord assures Israel, when you are in tough times, I will be with you. When you pass through the waters, through rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire and flame, danger of any kind, it will not consume you. And then again, look towards the end of the text to verse 5. Again, not quite the same thing word for word, not an exact repetition. Do not fear, I am with you. God promises his people not just that he will be with them in future, in difficult times, wonderful as that is. He assures them that he is with them now, so that they need not be afraid. Then you'll see in what I want to call verses 3b and 4b, pretty much a repetition. You'll see the words, I give, dot, 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 in exchange for your life. I don't have very much to say about that except that I'm sure it deliberately extends the chiasm in order to intensify the focus on the words which lie between those two phrases. Israel is so precious to the Lord that in some mysterious sense other nations are given up like a ransom, a price paid by God to achieve Israel's liberation. And so our focus is directed to the central middle verse of the poem to underline it and emphasize it you are precious in my sight and I love you that's what God says to his people to Israel not just that he's created and formed Israel not just that he's called Israel by name or even by his own name not just that he will be with Israel and is now with Israel not just that he gives other nations in exchange for Israel's life but that Israel is precious to him and honored and beloved. The Hebrew word for love there is aheb. That same word occurs in one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible, a beautifully circular text in Deuteronomy chapter 7. In verses 7 and 8 of Deuteronomy 7, Moses says to Israel, It was not because you were more numerous than any other people that the Lord set his heart upon you. Begging the question, 
Why then? Why did the Lord set his heart upon Israel? Answer, it was because the Lord loved you. Why does God set his heart upon his people? He just does, because he loves them. Same word, Achab. The point of Isaiah 43, 1 to 7, is to underline for Israel that, like Christians are told by John in John 21, that Israel is loved, beloved, deeply beloved by God. The second point I want to make is that that great affirmation of God's love for Israel is not confined to Isaiah 43, verse 4. There isn't anything quite so explicit in the rest of Isaiah 40 to 55, although the same thing is said in Isaiah 48, 14. Uh, the same Hebrew word is used, Israel is beloved. Um, but my view is that um, God's love for Israel um, uh, draws together a related set of terms that are scattered throughout the oracles of Isaiah 40 uh, to 55. So uh, when Israel is called God's friend, that's a good Johannine term, uh, God's friend in Isaiah 41 verse 8, uh, it implies God's love for Israel. This love is also implied when in chapter 44 verse 2 and chapter 44 verse 24, we're told that Israel was formed by God in the womb. Um, in Hebrew scripture, the womb is the seat of compassion. Uh, and when the Lord speaks of his tender mercy to Israel, as in chapter 54, verse 8, or chapter 55, verse 3. So I don't think I have any difficulty demonstrating uh, that just as every Christian disciple is beloved, so within the Hebrew scriptures, Israel is uh, beloved. But what about Bishop Gordon's second mark of uh, discipleship? Not just that we're loved by God, but are called to bear witness. Well, you'll see from the notes that that is covered off as well. Um, I want to direct you first back to Isaiah 43. Perhaps it's a coincidence that we find this affirmation in that same chapter as we read those words, I love you, but perhaps it's not a coincidence. Um, in chapter 43, we twice find an absolutely explicit affirmation that Israel is called by God to bear witness. In verse 10 and again in verse 12, you are my witnesses. God calls his servant, uh, his chosen, this is verse 10 of Isaiah 43, to bear witness to the nations, that's verse 9 of chapter 43, that there is but one God who is, uh, is saviour, who saves. Um, so Isaiah is assured of God's love and called to bear witness, witness to the nations that God is the one who saves. And that word witness does again occur um, somewhere else, uh, actually just once as far as I can find it in 44 uh, verse 8. But once again, there are a, a, a set of related terms which help to um, reinforce the point. Um, you'll remember that Isaiah is called to be a herald um, of good tidings in uh, chapter 40, verse 9, again in chapter 41 um, and verse 7. Uh, and in chapter 42 and verse 6, Israel is called to be a light to the nations. That seems to me to have exactly the same missionary uh, impetus, the idea uh, that Israel is, is called to be um, a witness to God before the nations. So can we just draw a straight line then? Can we not just draw a straight line then from Israel uh, to, to church? Um, Israel in Isaiah 40 to 55, church in uh, John uh, 21, or, or every Christian, um, as uh, John 21 was expounded by Bishop Gordon uh, this morning. Um, can we just not draw a, a straight line? What was true of Israel is now true um, of church. Well, well, well maybe not quite. Um, or, or maybe you could, but you might miss something theologically very rich and profound um, in the process. Because um, if I'm right, there is one more move we must make. 
which is to consider the relationship between Israel as the servant of the Lord and the figure of the servant of the Lord in the four so-called servant songs um, of Deutero Isaiah. And I just want to spend a bit of time sharing with you how I think that relationship um, shapes up. Uh, most of you will know, I assume, uh, that in the context of Isaiah 40 to 55, there are four poems which seem to stand a bit apart from the context of the surrounding oracles and which also seem somehow to belong together so that scholars routinely refer to them as the servant songs. You'll find them printed uh, on, the, uh, on the handout from Isaiah 42, 49, 50, uh, and then most famously 52, 13 to 53, 12. So who is this shadowy figure, the servant of the Lord? Um, the question is at least as old as the book of Acts. Uh, you may remember the Ethiopian eunuch um, in Acts chapter 8, in verse 34, asking the evangelist Philip with regard to the identity of the servant in the last of those servant songs, about whom, pray, does the prophet speak? About himself or about someone else? Which is the launching pad for Philip's evangelistic um, sermon. It's a good question because when you look at the songs in the context of Isaiah 40 to 55, it becomes clear that a, a certain element of ambiguity is integral to the figure of the servant. Uh, the picture you build up across all four songs, when you surround, uh, read them in the uh, context of the surrounding passages, um, has a built-in um, fluidity and elusiveness to it, perhaps not unlike um, what Bishop Gordon was saying is true of Jesus in the Gospels, a certain kind of elusiveness. And the crux of the puzzle comes in the second song, um, in the opening six verses of Isaiah 49. That's where you will find the only explicit identification of the servant in the four servant songs, but that is also exactly where you will find an obstacle to extending the identification even to the whole of the second servant song, let alone to um, all four songs. I'll try to explain. The text of chapter 49, verse 3 says, And he, Yahweh the Lord, said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. It's a perfectly clear and straightforward identification of the servant as Israel. And if the four servant songs are some sort of a unit, we might reasonably expect that that identification will hold good for them all. But it doesn't. It doesn't even hold good for the rest of this second servant song. Because just two verses later we read, And now the Lord says, Who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the survivors of Israel. I give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So now we're scratching our heads because in verse 3 it seems clear that the servant is Israel, but here in verses 5 and 6 the servant seems to have a commission to Israel and one person cannot both be Israel and have a ministry to Israel. What's going on? I want to show that for all the ambiguity and mystery in these songs, there is a fairly simple way to navigate through the maze. And that way is related to the shape of Isaiah 40 to 55 as a whole. I want to suggest all, that although no single identification of the servant figure seems to hold good for all four servant songs, there is a sequence which emerges when you set the songs closely uh, in their context. And a good place to start is with um, a basic distinction uh, in, um, between Isaiah 40 to 48 and Isaiah 49 to 55. And I've tried to set out this, um, the um, text, the, the verses um, I'm drawing on here on the very last page, page four um, of the handout. 
Um, Isaiah 40 to 48 proclaim the impending fall of Babylon. Uh, They reach a climax with an oracle in chapter 47 directed against Babylon and prophesying um, its fall. Um, These verses, um, these chapters 40 to 48, um, are about a new thing that Yahweh is doing. And that phrase, a new thing or new things, occurs three times in chapters 42, 43 and 48. Uh, the, same, the same idea is conveyed by the term the things to come. They are the new thing, new things. Uh, that phrase things to come occurs just twice in chapter 41 verse 44. Those new things or things to come are contrasted with the former things. And you'll see half a dozen references to the former things all in chapters 41 uh, to 48. Notice that all those references to new things, former things, things to come, they're all confined to 40 to 48. The new thing will be the overthrow of Babylon by Cyrus. Uh, Cyrus raised up to be God's shepherd, startlingly at one point, uh, the Lord's anointed. The Lord's anointed is Cyrus. It just so happens that references to Cyrus are also confined to chapters 44 and 45. References to Babylon to chapters 43 to 48 and to Chaldea, which is just another word for Babylon, to chapters 47 and 48. Polemic against idols is also restricted to this first half, if I can put it uh, that way, of Deutero Isaiah. From chapter 49 onwards, attention shifts from the fall of Babylon to the impending return of the exiles from captivity. The emphasis shifts onto the rebuilding of Zion. The distributions of terms aren't quite so neat, but the emphasis falls from looking back to looking forward, from what has happened to what uh, will now happen. And then in order to grasp the context of the servant songs, there's one other contrast to note between chapters 40 to 48 on the one hand and chapters, well, 49-7 at the end of the second servant song uh, to the end of chapter um, 55. We'll keep the um, second servant song uh, distinct, separate, and look at it carefully in in a moment. Uh, There's one other distribution of terms which is um, significant, and you'll find these on uh, the first page um, at paragraph 4. When Deutero Isaiah speaks of the people of God, he normally employs one of the following terms, Jacob, Israel, or Jerusalem, Zion. But as you'll see from those tables, the terms are not distributed evenly. Uh, The terms Jacob and Israel occur heavily in the first half, and the uh, the references to Zion and Jerusalem are weighted at least somewhat more fully uh, to the second half. And actually, if you then, and if you just turn over the page to... Uh, No, sorry, it's right at the bottom of page one. Um, If you eliminate from the first table references to um, Jacob and Zion, which are not referring directly to the people of God, but to God, uh, to God as the mighty one of Jacob or as the holy one of Zion. Uh, If you remove those references to God from the table, um, then it's really quite startling. All the references to Jacob and Israel then are in chapters 40 uh, to 48, apart from uh, the small number uh, in the second um, servant song. The the data, as I say, is a little less compelling where the terms Zion and Jerusalem are concerned. I can't eliminate every reference to Zion and Jerusalem uh, from the first half of Deuteronomy Isaiah, uh, much as my neat and tidy mind would like to. Uh, But you will see that they um, are more prominent um, in chapters 49, 7 to 55, 13. Um, And in addition... In Isaiah 40 to 55 as a whole, Zion speaks only once and is addressed by God only twice. And those three occasions are all in 49.7 onwards. Zion neither speaks nor is addressed in Isaiah 40 to 48. Um, All of this contributes, I want to suggest, 
to uh, the degree to which the personification of Israel becomes less intense in the second half, just as the portrait of the servant becomes more personal in the second half. I'll say that again. Uh, the, the, the treatment of Jacob and Israel becomes less personalized, less, the personalization of Jacob and Israel becomes less intense in the second half, um, so that God is more inclined to address his people as Jerusalem or Zion. It's less personal. Just as the portrait of the servant becomes more personalized, so that it's really only in the third servant song that we discover the servant has a beard which can be plucked out and cheeks that can be slapped. Uh, and in the um, final servant song, uh, that the servant can die and be laid in a tomb. The, the portrait of the servant is becoming more personalized as the surrounding context is becoming less personalized. There's one further feature, and then we'll look at the text in um, a little more detail. Um, as a matter of fact, it's not just in Isaiah 49, verse 3, that Israel is called the servant of the Lord. It's just that that is the only identification or, that occurs within the four servant songs. Outside of the servant songs, in Deuteronomy more generally, there are seven other places where Israel is called God's servant. Again, you'll see those on the back page at 41.8, 44.1, 44.2, twice in 44.21, again in 45.4, again in 48.20. And again, note that all those references to Israel as God's servant are in Isaiah 40 to 48. There are four cases in which you will encounter a couplet that runs like this. You are Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen. Uh, the word chosen comes nine times in Isaiah 40 to 55 as a whole. Eight of those references are in chapters 40 to 48. The last time is right at the tipping point in Isaiah 49, verse 7. Outside Isaiah 49, 1 to 6, there are only three places which refer to the servant outside the servant songs. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, in the second half of Deuteronomy, Isaiah, three references to, um, to the servant. Two are in the servant song, um, in the fourth servant song, the beginning and end of uh, the fourth servant song. Um, Behold my servant whom I uphold. Um, uh, and the last is right on the fringe of the third um, servant song. And none of those three require an identification of the servant as Israel. So in the light of that, I just want to focus on each of the servant songs um, in turn, uh, and I want to sketch out uh, a sequence which I think holds firm, uh, which then allows us to make a link more strongly um, to Jesus um, at the end. So Isaiah 42, uh, 1 to 9 or, or 1 to 6, uh, scholars debate over where the song um, finishes. Um, you'll see the, the text laid out uh, on, the, uh, on the handout. Um, the speaker is the Lord, uh, but who is the servant then um, in chapter uh, 42? Here is my servant. Who is this servant um, upheld by God, chosen uh, by God? Well, by this point, Israel has already been called the servant of the Lord twice in Deuteronomy Isaiah in 41.8 and 41.9. And just as in this song, the Lord's servant is chosen by the Lord and upheld by the Lord, so Israel is chosen and upheld in 41.8 and 41.10. And given that the only figure identified as God's servants in chapters 40 to 48 is Israel, and that in 49.3, in the second servant song, we're going to find Israel identified as the servant, I would need considerable persuasion not to assume that that is the identification here. It is sometimes suggested that the vocation of the servant in this song is more active, and that outside the song, Israel as servant has a role which is more passive. And although that's generally true, there is nothing very passive 
about Israel's calling in, for example, chapter 41, verses 15 and 16, where the Lord says to Israel, I will make of you a threshing sledge. You shall thresh the mountains and crush them. It's hard to imagine a more vigorous image, a more active commission than that. If there is a distinction to be made between the character of the servant in this song and the character of the servant outside this song in chapters 40 to 48, I suggest it relates to Israel's current situation, exiled and oppressed in Babylon, and Israel's destiny to bring justice to the nations. And a distinction in the character of the servant, active in this song, passive mostly outside this song, that doesn't, it seems to me, add up to a necessary distinction in the identity of the servant. I hope you're with me so far. So then comes the second servant song in Isaiah 49, 1 to 6. Just on the hinge of the great divide between Isaiah 40 to 48 on the one hand and the rest of 49 to 55 on the other. Given that fundamental shift, it shouldn't surprise us to find this song the most puzzling one and the only one which, to my mind, defies a neat interpretation, one in which, in my mind, there is, in fact, a shift. So the song opens with an appeal to the coastlands on the lips of the servant, reflecting on his calling from the womb to be the Lord's servant, a phrase used of Israel in 44.2, 44.24. And when in verse 3 the song goes on to say, you are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified, we note that in 44.15 the Lord had promised that he would indeed be glorified in Israel. If at this point in the song, The servant is identified as Israel in an entirely straightforward way that would be entirely in keeping with everything that has gone before in chapters 40 to 48. But then, in verse 4, the servant laments that he has labored in vain. This servant, Israel, I suggest, is ready to give up. This is Israel who in 42.19 is blind and deaf, who sees many things but does not observe them. His ears are open, but he does not hear. And then verse 5 gives us continuity and discontinuity. Again, we're told that the servant was formed in the womb. There's the continuity. Israel, as God's servant, has been said to have been formed in the womb. But now we're told the servant's mission will be to Israel, to bring Jacob back to him, that Israel might be gathered to him. There's the discontinuity. And the and now of verse 5 is the break point, it seems to me, in the identification of the servant in this song and in all four songs. Who is this servant formed in the womb, called to bring Jacob back to him that Israel might be gathered to him? Who can it be but the prophet? Throughout chapters 40 to 48, the prophet's purpose has been to mobilize Israel in order that Israel, a servant of the Lord, might again take up the task to which Israel has been called by Yahweh to be a light to the nations. But in verse 4, Israel has declared that its strength in that vocation is spent. And if Israel will not take up that vocation, who will? What is God to do? And that brings us to verse 6. Here is plan B. Now the Lord's servant has a vocation not just to Israel, but to the nations. The prophet is called now to be a light to the nations. That salvation will reach to the ends of the earth. God is absolutely intent that that mission will be successful. It will bear fruit. The good news of his salvation will reach to the ends of the earth. And if Israel has resigned that vocation, it will now be refocused on this servant, the prophet of God. I hope you're still with me. I do realize this is hardcore Bible study. I have no doubt that this is the right reading of the text. And the key to my confidence is the repetition in 49.1 and 49.5 of the fact that the servant of the Lord was called while still in the womb. That description applies to Israel in verse 1, but now to the prophet in verse 5. So comes the third song, 
where I suggest there is no obstacle to the identification of the servant with the prophet. Uh, Come to that, there's no actual reference in this song to the servant, although its status as a servant song is not in dispute. The song falls into two parts. In the first part, in verses 4 to 6, the servant reflects on his dependence on the Lord. Commissioned by the Lord, the servant has encountered opposition and abuse, although we're not told by whom. The second half of the song looks forward to a future vindication which the servant is expecting from the Lord. This experience, I suggest, is hard to map onto Israel because this servant has in good faith been obedient to the vocation. And that cannot now be said of the nation. And although it is just about possible to imagine a metaphorical application to Israel of the references in this song to a back and a beard and cheeks, there is a greater degree of personalization here, of individualization here, just as, I was suggesting a moment ago, the surrounding nations depersonalize Israel. Just as Israel ceases to be the preferred term for the people of God and the less personal, less individualized term Zion, Jerusalem is used, the servant figure becomes more individual, more personal, because I'm convinced here the servant is the prophet. And that brings us finally to the most personalized of all four servant songs and to Isaiah 52.13 to 53.12. In a famous literary approach to these verses, Professor David Klein's revered not just here in Sheffield identified six questions which this song leaves unanswered. Who is he? What did he suffer? Did he actually die? Who are we? What led we to change our minds about the servant? Who are they? This last and longest song breaks into three parts. In the first and last, in 52, 13 to 15, and 53, 12, it is the Lord who speaks. In between, the speaker is an anonymous we, some community of supporters of the servant of the Lord. The very first verse, 52.13, is a clear allusion to to 42.1, the very first verse of the very first servant song. If the earlier verse represents the initial commissioning of the servant, this verse signals the climax of the servant's ministry. And the two speeches of the Lord, which top and tail the text, focus on the exaltation of the servant. The verses in between focus on the humiliation of the servant. Now, throughout the whole of Isaiah 1 to 66, the words exalt, lift up, on high are virtual synonyms. And the particular thrust of Isaiah 1 to 6 is that only Yahweh can truly be described as exalted and lifted up. So when we read that the servant will be exalted and lifted up and made very high in 52.13, we know that the, the servant is being spoken of in terms that associate the servant to an extraordinary extent, extent with the living God himself. It's very loaded language. Arguably, there is a reference to the exaltation and vindication of the servant in the central section, but really only uh, in verse 10, uh, perhaps more obviously in verse 11. But essentially, in the central section, certainly in verses 1 to 9 of chapter 53, the focus is on the humiliation and suffering of the servant. But there is a crucial shift in verse 4, when for the first time it's noted that the sufferings of the servant were purposeful. The sufferings were for our infirmities, for our transgressions, for our iniquities. The servant is suffering not just innocently, but purposefully. And the place given to purposeful suffering in these verses is without parallel either in any of the other servant songs or to anything else in Isaiah 40 to 55 or indeed Isaiah as a whole. Yet it is a vocation that we, whoever we are, came to recognize. That's clear in verse 6. 
at least some of the contemporaries of the servant have now come to believe that this servant shall see his offspring and shall prolong his day. Some sort of vindication is envisaged here, um, vague, uh, imprecise as the language might be. The poem doesn't quite speak of resurrection, but it certainly seems to imply some sort of vindication beyond the grave. In a renowned piece of literary criticism, Professor Kleins notes that the pronouns I, we, he, they are consistently and presumably intentionally left anonymous, but also in that in each section of the song, the key relationships are the way in which the other characters relate to him, he. Uh, the, the poem explores the relationship of I and he, we and he, they and he, but not we and they, or, uh, or he and, or they and I. Um, he, says Klein, stands at the nexus of relationships. But who is he? Even Klein's accepts that I, you'll find I, particularly in the first and last sections of the song, that I is the Lord. They are more ambiguous. They seem to refer to the nations at large in 5215, but also, I think, to the people of Israel in general in 539 and 5311. We seem to be those among the people of God who recognize and embrace the ministry of the servant. But he, who is he? To return to the question of the Ethiopian eunuch, about whom, pray, does the prophet speak? About himself or about someone else? I hope I've been able to show that there are multiple vocational parallels between Israel as the servant of the Lord and the prophet as the servant of the Lord. Both are chosen. Both are formed in the womb. Both are called to be a light to the nations. Both are uplifted. In both, God will be glorified, and so on. Both, I would assert, are called to be loved and to bear witness. Clearly, there is a line to be drawn from here, through Jesus, to the church. These vital parallels between Israel as the servant of the Lord and the prophet as the servant of the Lord somehow feed into our Christian experience so that just as they were called to be loved and to bear witness, we know that we are called to bear witness, to be loved and bear witness. But how is that line to be drawn? Ironically, I think the answer has to do with contrasts as much as similarities. As much as there are vocational parallels to be noted between Israel as the servant and the prophet as the servant, there are also significant differences to be taken into account. And it's those which lead us from Israel via prophet to Jesus. You see, it's evident in Isaiah 40 to 55 that Israel has been disobedient and has suffered for his own sins. Isaiah 40 verse 2 and yet has complained and feels himself to be forsaken by the Lord, Isaiah 40, verse 27. By contrast, the prophet has been obedient and has suffered not for his own sins, but for Israel's sins, has nevertheless accepted that suffering in silence and so can expect a future vindication. This is a truly remarkable development. The sufferings of the Lord's servant are spoken of in these verses, not just as an essential part of the mission, but almost as the mission of the servant itself. It is in his very sufferings that the servant of the Lord fulfills his calling. Nothing in the call of Israel has prepared us for such a thing, and nothing relating to the prophet in the earlier servant songs until the last has done so either. There is an unprecedented emphasis here on the suffering of the servant of the Lord and his subsequent vindication. It's true that there are points of contact 
between this final poem and what has gone before. So just as the servant is described in 53.3 as despised, so the prophet is called despised in 49.7. In chapter 49, it was said that kings would stand up and prostrate themselves before the servant of the Lord, the prophet. And here in verse 50, uh, 15 of chapter 52, it said that kings will shut their mouths because of him. So much, I want to suggest, of the lived experience of the prophet might well have conformed to the portrait of the servant in these verses, such that it seems entirely plausible to me that it was written by the followers of the prophet, yes, reflecting on some death and vindication pattern in the experience of the prophet. This is normal for Hebrew prophecy. The primary application of a prophet's words are almost always to the generation of the prophet concerned. And yet, just as many of the biblical prophecies of the return of Israel from exile in Babylon exceeded Israel's actual experience of that event and so fueled eschatological hopes of the coming of God's kingdom, so in this case we find the meditation on the ministry of the prophet to be both a fit to the experience of the prophet and going far beyond the experience of that prophet becoming an inspired anticipation of the prophet, the prophet who was to come. As far as I can see, it is not in the end possible to find in the lived experience of any individual whose biography is recorded in the pages of Hebrew scripture any wholly satisfying fulfillment of the final servant song which reaches beyond so that whatever vindication the prophet might have had as the servant of the Lord, it did not obviously, satisfyingly fulfill the portrait of 52.13 to 53.12, making the Christological identification of the servant figure by Philip not just possible, but inevitable. So here I'm wanting to suggest is the secure line from Israel called to be loved and to bear witness to Christians called to be loved and to bear witness. It's a line that connects the vocation of Israel to the vocation of the church and of every member of the church, but significantly via the prophet in the servant songs and so via Jesus, the ultimate servant of the Lord. It is on that basis that all of us who are baptized into him are called to be loved and to bear witness. Thank you for your patience.